Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Positive Psychology Center's Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is James Powelski, and I am Director of Education and Senior Scholar at the Positive Psychology Center, as well as an adjunct associate professor of religious studies in the School of Arts and Sciences. I'm sure that many of you, uh, if not most of you, are at least somewhat familiar with positive psychology, but because many things are reported about it in the press, some more accurate than others, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to say something about the field and also the role of the Positive Psychology Center. Positive psychology is the, study, is the scientific study of the strengths that enable individuals and communities to thrive. The field is founded on the belief that people want to lead meaningful and fulfilling lives, to cultivate what is best within themselves, and to enhance their experiences of love, work, and play. For the last 50 years, psychology has been largely concerned with the understanding and treatment of mental illness from the perspective of a disease model, and many successes have been achieved. One consequence of this focus on psychological problems, however, is that psychology has had little to say about what makes life worth living. When Martin Seligman served as the president of the American Psychological Association in 1998, his primary presidential initiative was the creation of positive psychology to correct this imbalance by focusing on strengths as well as weaknesses, on building the best things in life as well as repairing the worst, asserting that human goodness and excellence are just as authentic as distress and disorder, and that the mission of psychology entails more than the undoing of problems. Suffering and well-being are both part of the human condition, and psychologists have a responsibility to be concerned with both. The Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania was founded by Marty Seligman in 2003. It is the leading center for research, teaching, application, and dissemination of positive psychology in the world, and continues to play a leading role in developing the scientific infrastructure for this new discipline involving hundreds of researchers worldwide. Work at the center includes ongoing research in a variety of domains of human flourishing, as well as training programs to enhance resilience and well-being. In 2005, we opened the door to our Master of Applied Positive Psychology MAP program, and over the last six years, more than 200 students have come from all across the world to study the research and the application of positive psychology. For those of you who are interested, this information and much more about positive psychology and the Positive Psychology Center can be found on our website at www.positivepsychology.org. This is the inaugural event in our Distinguished Speaker Series. This series was founded to bring to Penn's campus empirical researchers in topics related to positive psychology as well as humanities scholars to help foster dialogue between the sciences and the humanities on topics of human flourishing. This dialogue between science and the humanities is part of a new initiative I'm spearheading at the Positive Psychology Center. The humanities have such rich traditions and resources for studying human flourishing, and the sciences are increasingly creating fascinating new knowledge in this area. I have developed a course on humanities and human flourishing, which I'm teaching for the first time this semester in the MAP program, and I'm very pleased that today's speaker will be giving a special presentation in that class tomorrow. We look forward to finding new ways of fostering this conversation between science and humanities uh, here at Penn in the coming days. As indicated on the handout you received, we have two more talks in the series coming up this spring. On April 21st, we will welcome Josh Green, who will be talking with us about his work in neuroethics. And on April 28th, best-selling author and TED Prize winner Karen Armstrong will be speaking to us about the importance of compassion in religion. And now to today's talk. We are delighted to have Julia Annis here as our inaugural distinguished speaker. We're also grateful to the philosophy department for co-sponsoring her presentation. And the bookstore has kindly helped us spread the word <clears throat> about today's event and has offered to bring over some of Julia's books, which will be available for purchase in the lobby after her talk. Julia Annis is a graduate of Oxford University with a PhD from Harvard University. 
Having taught at Oxford and Columbia Universities, she has been Regents Professor at the University of Arizona since 1995. She has published over 100 books and articles, including her 1993 book, The Morality of Happiness. Her new book, Intelligent Virtue, is due out from Oxford this year. She's the founder and former editor of the journal Oxford Studies and Ancient Philosophy. In 1992, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And in 2003 and 2004, she served as the president of the Pacific Division of the American Philosophical Association. She's received numerous awards uh, for teaching, mentoring students, and other work. And she's been a leading light throughout her career uh, in the study of philosophical views in the ancient world. Her work on ethics and its connection to happiness is especially important for our purposes today. Please join me in giving a warm pen welcome to Julia Annis. Thank you very much indeed for those warm words, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm aware, since I'm talking to an audience mostly of non-philosophers, I should apologize that I don't have any PowerPoints, or <laughs> which are more usual, of course, outside philosophy. Uh, philosophy is just not visual in that way. Uh, sometimes we do PowerPoints that have words on it. You know, you can split up the talk and do it that way, but that puts me to sleep, so <laughs> I imagine it puts other people to sleep. So this is just an old-fashioned lecture. There's a handout, and that just, as it were, um, takes you through the lecture. It doesn't have any formulae. It uh, doesn't give you necessary and sufficient conditions for anything, so um, you can just use it or not. So what does it mean to flourish? Well, I take it we all want to flourish, and none of us want to languish, or whatever the opposite of flourishing is. But although it seems obvious, it's less obvious why we all want to flourish, because it's not obvious what it means for us to flourish. The idea of flourishing needs clarification in many ways. I hope the talk will make some progress towards that. <coughs> now, why talk about flourishing rather than happiness, especially here? Um, Philosophers have been studying happiness for over 2,000 years. In the last two decades, contemporary ethical theorists have been taking over some of the better ideas, taking them seriously, and developing ideas for us of happiness and virtue that revive for us the insights of ancient philosophy. Because for ancient philosophy, happiness and virtue were the basic ideas. <coughs> and virtue ethics and eudaimonism have once more become reasonably central in philosophy. Eudaimonism being theories of ethics where happiness is the basic idea. And of course, again I don't need to stress here, the rise of positive psychology and the work of Marty Seligman has made happiness central in uh, positive psychology and psychology and in many areas of the social sciences and humanities generally. In the last few years there's been a growth in what's been called Happiness studies. Happiness studies are the ones who have, so to speak, hit the news. There's now, you now can barely open a magazine or a newspaper without something about happiness, whether we have it, who does and who doesn't, and so on. And some politicians have taken the ideas up. The British Prime Minister, David Cameron, recently announced that the government will be creating a national happiness index with quarterly reports. This doesn't, I am not making this up. <laughs> this is from the New York Times. So it must be true. <laughs> Starting next month, the government will pose the following questions and ask people to respond on a, a scale of 0 to 10. How happy did you feel yesterday? How anxious did you feel yesterday? How satisfied are you with your life nowadays? To what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are worthwhile? Now, note three out of the four questions were about feeling. This kind of study of happiness is often done by <coughs> life satisfaction questionnaire, often done with a standard satisfaction with life scale used by Ed Diener and others, or by experience sampling. Experience sampling is illustrated by um, a study called Mappiness, run by the London School of Economics. It's mapping happiness. And it's done by giving people a free app for their iPhone and then beeping them at random intervals and asking them, how happy do you feel, how relaxed do you feel, and where are you? Right. Well, there's a GPS thing, so I mean, they don't need, they know where the people are. They map them by the GPS. Now, what people are being asked 
in this sort of study, especially the mappiness kind of study, and I imagine the British government study will be the same sort of thing, is their psychological state. What are you feeling about the way things are going with you? Now, is this a question about happiness? Well, it's a question about one notion of happiness that we definitely have. Otherwise, these studies wouldn't have been um, set up in the way they have. It, but this is, is this all we mean by happiness? Now here I want to pose the question via an example used some time ago by the Canadian philosopher Wayne Sumner, which has had quite a long history. It's the Susan example. <coughs> Susan is, to all appearances, a happily married woman with a wonderful husband and two marvellous children. She lives in a congenial place, fill it in, she enjoys her activities. The only problem is her husband's away in business a lot. But she honestly says she feels happy. Now, at some point, Susan discovers her husband has all the time had another family with another wonderful wife and another two marvellous children and has been dividing his time between them. Now, unequivocally, Susan is devastated, her life falls to bits. The question is, during the time when she was deceived, was she happy? Now, we can take it, again, obviously, she felt happy. Was she happy during those years because she felt she was? Now, I've used this, I use this question a lot in classes and at least in philosophy classes, I'm not going to try it today, um, it divides the class. Uh, it's never the case that everybody thinks, yes, she obviously was happy. It doesn't always divide it evenly, but it always divides the class. Some people think, obviously, if she felt happy, she was. That's what it is to be happy, is to feel happy. And there's no more to be said about her happiness, though there's more to be said about other things about her life. But some people always demur. They say, when we ask about whether she was happy, we take more into account in judging her happy or not than her own psychological state. And you can make this vivid in various ways. Put it in the first person. Would you choose Susan's life during those 10 years? Feeling great, but being deceived. And uh, when you put it that way, the class tends to divide a bit differently. Now, the point of the example, I think, is that it divides people. And this shows that our notion of happiness isn't a straightforward one in which all you need to be happy is to feel happy. Our idea of happiness contains some aspects conflicting with this. We have, in fact, I think, two conceptions of happiness. The uh, philosopher Richard Kraut ma made this point 20 years ago uh, in a classic article that's been reprinted. Um, we, we, if we wish a child a happy life, we're not wishing for the child a life in which they feel happy about it, regardless of what the life actually is. If we find the child has grown up to live a degraded life of prostitution and drug addiction but feels perfectly happy, we don't feel our wish has been fulfilled. We think that's a, a pitiable life, not a happy one. Now, happiness studies <coughs> are clearly interested <coughs> in our psychological state, not the longer term, term kind of happiness. That's what happiness and the British government studies are interested in. In fact, people interested in happiness studies are often baffled by the idea that happiness could be anything else. There's a recent book by Derek Bock, the former um, president of Harvard, called The Politics of Happiness. <coughs> and in this, he argues that politicians should take account of happiness studies in the formation of policy. Those happiness studies are <coughs> better, if anything, than many of the empirical studies that politicians do regularly take account of. When he gets to the Susan problem, he actually can't understand it. He says, of course she was happy because she felt happy. And he says, some philosophers say she wasn't happy even though she felt happy. And he puzzles about what they could possibly mean by this. They can't mean that she was happy because after all, she, that she wasn't happy, because after all, she felt happy. They must mean something else, that she was happy, but it wasn't happiness worth having or something. Well, no, that's not what they meant. <laughs> she wasn't happy. But the interesting thing here is Bock can only think that it's some weird out-of-touch philosophers who have somehow come up with this weird view. Now, in, what's important is, it's not just some philosopher's weird view. It's what a lot of ordinary people think about the Susan example. That's why philosophers are interested in it, be precisely because ordinary people divide on this. Now, why does Bock find it impossible to so much as get his mind around the idea that Susan was not happy, <coughs> although she felt she was? He clearly thinks the psychological state view of happiness is all that happiness can mean. Now, we might not think this matters much. We might think, oh, this is going to turn out to be some trivial point about what the word happiness means. But I think it raises a large issue. After all, think of the British government study. The British government is proposing to spend enormous amounts of money 
and commandeer vast amounts of time on the part of public servants, not to mention frequently intruding on its citizens, bugging them at all times to ask them how happy they feel, which would annoy me, actually. I'd probably mess up the results by saying, go away, get lost, or something. Um, but the, this is a big, important political issue. Happiness is clearly taken to be important as a social goal that politicians should work towards implementing. But here, there's clearly a gap. If all happiness can possibly be is what Susan is feeling even when she's being deceived, why should the government care about that as a social goal that policy should be implemented towards? What's so special about this psychological state that it's important for governments to be promoting it? And in fact, presumably Bock isn't thinking that. He's thinking getting to public policy to take happiness seriously is a matter of improving people's lives, not just their psychological states. And that's what's being assumed, I think, in Mappiness and all these studies. But as long as happiness is just assumed to be the psychological state, Susan's state, before she found the truth, it's not clear how we cross this gap between psychological state and valuable social goal. And this is where I think the idea of flourishing proves to be useful. Because flourishing is a long-term idea. You can't flourish for five minutes. You can't, get phone, you can't get a buzz on your iPhone and ask, are you flourishing right now? That doesn't really make sense. It's in itself a longer-term idea. We say plants and civilizations flourish, and what seems to be going on is the idea of a life. So flourishing, I think, is useful as the notion of happiness, where that means a happy life. So there is something to be said for, in some contexts at least, just giving the term happiness to the people who think it's a psychological state and say, there is this other important thing, which is what you have in mind when you think it's a social goal, and that's flourishing, the notion of a, f a life going well a life going well in a way that's good and pleasing to the person who has it. Now, we don't have to make this move of using flourishing in this way, and um, I freely admit I don't always make it in everything I write about um, happiness in, in the ancient or modern world. I think um, talking to a non-academic audience, it's more important to talk in terms of two kinds of happiness because I, those are the intuitions people have. But happiness has been the focus of so much academic work that I think uh, th um, it's clearer in many contexts to use flourishing for the notion of happiness that isn't exhausted by uh, the psychological state view. And for what it's worth, it's an introductory class. I, I haven't done a study of this, but in introductory classes, the Susan example divides people more. It, um, as you go up and get more advanced, uh, more and more people say happiness just is what you feel, uh, you're happy if you feel you are. And by the time you get to graduates, it doesn't divide the class at all. <laughs> Everybody says yes, except one or two people who already have theories on the topic. So, um, uh, well, I have an example before going on. Um, I think where talking about flourishing would avoid certain confusions that can come in with the use of happiness. In happiness studies, um, it's often it's some, well, treated as a, a really solid result that having children doesn't make you more happy, it makes you less happy. I've heard this quoted um, by Ruth Weinhoven, who's a, a Dutch researcher who runs the World Database of Happiness website. People think having children will make them happier, but it doesn't because people get phone contacted and asked, do you feel happier? And they say no. Now, it might seem a puzzling situation. Uh, a recent article in Time magazine, you can tell I'm not quoting this as a serious result, it's Time magazine, reports research from the University of Western Ontario to the effect that this is just cognitive dissonance. We think children make us happy, but they don't. So how do we solve this cognitive dissonance? Well, we delude ourselves. We delude ourselves into thinking having children makes us happier when in fact it doesn't. It's all confabulation, right? That's what the research shows. This appeared in Time magazine under the headline, Why Children Make You, Quotes, Literally Delusional. <laughs> <laughs> now, ch children may make you feel less happy at a certain time, but I don't think we think children make us lead a less flourishing life or make our lives go worse. 
If we thought that, we'd be glad when they died. And, and if anything is wrong, that has to be wrong, right? So I think distinguishing flourishing from the psychological state of happiness might have avoided that bit of um, that conclusion. So I've taken quite a long time to distinguish flourishing from happiness, but I hope in the process I've shown why the fact that we want to flourish is an important fact. We have a long-term interest in our lives going well, and that's not just a matter of the psychological state of feeling good. So what then does it mean to flourish? Well, there are two ways to answer this question, and they're both important, but I think it matters to keep them separate. One is the most obviously practical way, and that's to focus on the conditions for flourishing, things that enable or conduce to your flourishing. Am I more likely to live a flourishing life if I get married, have children, pursue ambitions, work hard, and so on? And a great deal of energy has gone into answering this question. But philosophers since Socrates have insisted that before we can give this kind of question, any kind of clear answer, we first need to get clear on another question. What is flourishing anyway? That's the Socratic question. What is it that these are the conditions for it? And until we're clear on what flourishing is, Socrates would say, we can't be clear about how we're to get it. And I don't think this is philosophers being tiresome and not letting you get started. It's just common sense, I think, to get clear on this question before asking what we should do or what we should get in order to achieve flourishing. And it's a harder question than the other one because we get less help with it from common sense. And so far, what I've said about flourishing has all been very informal. It's your life going well. It's what we might mean by a happy life. It's your life going well in the reasonably long term. It's more than just how you feel at a given time. It's your welfare and interest being furthered rather than just feeling good about the way you are. Can we progress towards any deeper understanding? Well, here I suggest we get help from philosopher, philosophy, as I would, being a philosopher, and especially from Aristotle's seminal discussion in the Nicomachean Ethics of eudaimonia, which is translated sometimes happiness, sometimes flourishing, and so you might say it's perfect for what we need it for. Aristotle starts from what I've called the entry point for ethical reflection, and it's this. We're all doing something all the time, namely living our lives. We don't normally think of it that way. It would seem a bit odd to pose the question, but once we do, we're all in the process of living our lives. And there's two ways we're doing this. One is the most obvious way. We do one thing, and then another thing, and then another thing. And we do so continually until at some point we die, and then it stops. And this gives us one way of looking at our lives, the linear way. I do this, and then that, and then the other. But there's another way of looking at our lives, and this we can see if we stop back and ask, what am I doing now? And why am I doing it now? And we're not usually doing what we do now for the sake of what comes next. You don't go to a class at 10 in order to go to a class at 11. Suppose you ask someone, why are you going to the 10 o'clock math class? It's not in order to go to the 11 a.m. English class. It's more like along the lines of, well, to fulfill a requirement. Why do you want to do that? Well, I want to graduate with an economics major. Why do you want to do that? I want to prepare myself for a certain range of jobs. Why do you want to do that? Why do you want a job of that sort? Because I value having a good salary and security and status. Why do you value those things? And so on. And this is a familiar way of thinking, which I'll call the structured way of thinking about your life. And we think uh, we live our lives uh, all the time in these two ways, the linear and the structured way. And the structured way has some interesting features. Because all these questions and answers are about how you're thinking about your life now, but it's not just a question of how right now are you feeling about your life now, it's how now are you seeing your life as a whole in terms of the goals you have. It's this non-chronological perspective, the perspective in terms of why you're doing what you're doing in terms of goals. And one goal leads to another goal because it gives point to the nearer one. We don't just get up in the morning. We don't just go to a class. We do these things for reasons, and the reasons make sense in terms of the goals we have, and these in turn make sense in terms of the further goals we have. And these answers and the goals they describe get more and more general and vague as we get further from the present. The further away the goals are, the less specific they tend to be. And if you think about it, that's only to be expected. So you only know now, very vaguely, what sort of thing, as you get older, you'll find interesting. 
So you only have a vague idea of the work that you, by undertaking now, will give you the work you find interesting later. And right now, there's no way you can fill in the vagueness because the more specific answers only come with experience. You find out what sort of jobs you find congenial. You find out that you can't stand an office job or that you are comfortable with risk or whatever. So right now, when you think of the job you're aiming towards, you know some things, but you can't fill in very specifically what you're going to do for the rest of your life. That only happens with experience and age. <coughs> so I'm better at it than most of you. <laughs> Not because I'm better at anything except getting old and having had more experience. Now Aristotle notoriously says all these chains of further goals will end up in one place. We have one final overarching end. A lot of people thought, no, no I don't. I just want you know, a career and a family. I don't want them as means to something further. And why only one thing? Why can't I have three or four ultimate goals? Well, the answer to that, and it's a bit blunt and mundane, is I only have one life. Uh, because I can only live one life, I somehow have to achieve these goals in one life, and that means I have to negotiate among these goals as to how to live them in one coherent way. And that's what it is to have a final goal. That's all it is to have a final goal when you start. You don't, when you start, have a determinate and specific overall goal that all your other goals are specific steps towards. But the structured way of thinking doesn't imply that. The structured way of thinking makes it very obvious that the further away a goal is from what we're doing now, the less specific it is. So all that's being claimed is that as we live, uh, we have some very unspecific overall goal in mind, as is shown by the fact that we don't just have lots of goals. We try to make them coherent. We negotiate between them. We don't try to join the Marines and be a ballet dancer. It wouldn't work in any, either order, I think. And these decisions and trade-offs that we make are so obvious that we often don't notice that we're actually doing this. We're working towards one coherent way of living. Now, someone might say, well, can something even be my goal if it's indeterminate? I think, why not? We can be motivated to seek power before having any specific idea about what power exactly and how to go about getting it. Lots of people are. So I think to aim at flourishing and find out en route what the best way is for me to do that is no more problematic than aiming at power and finding out en route what's the best way of doing that. So the fact that it's unspecific doesn't make it unimportant in our lives, nor is the fact that we don't normally have a word for it. Aristotle says it's obvious to everybody that we do have a word for it in, in ordinary language, which is eudaimonia, and we don't have any concept that corresponds to eudaimonia. It's not obvious to us that either happiness or flourishing is what we aim at in everything we do. It becomes obvious when you've sat through a lecture or two and see the point of saying that, but it's not obvious right off. So we lack a term for it, but that lacking a term for it doesn't mean that we don't have it. And that we have it appears to be apparent from the structure of deliberation. And also, if we think of flourishing in this way, whether we use the term or not, as being the best term we can come up with for the unspecific final goal that we use when we integrate our deliberations, we found a point where common sense meets ethical theory. This is something we're all doing, and we all want to do it well. Nobody starts out wanting to make a mess of their lives. So we all want to live our lives in some way such that we flourish. But of course, there's no general agreement as to how we do it. And there's a number of views about how to flourish both everyday views and views from ethical theory. And I think in this respect, we find ourselves exactly in the same position as Aristotle's audience over 2,000 years ago. We're all living our lives. We're all implicitly uh, living it in such a way that we are negotiating our various goals so that they lead coherently to um, an overall way of living well. But what should we actually do to go about doing it? What's the first step? Well, maybe I've got some ideas of my own. Maybe I want to be a doctor or a teacher. Maybe I get an answer from religion. The culture in general, TVs, movies, suggests all sorts of ideas. And you can walk into bookstores and buy self-help books that will tell you. And many have the advantages that if you buy the book, you can put the their answer into practice and so flourish in only two weeks. <laughs> because 
that's all the time busy people have, right? <coughs> but I think more seriously, there are philosophical answers here. And in the case of a flourishing life, I think contemporary ethical philosophers have recently returned to this tradition. Whereas for about 150 years, the question was simply ignored or it was relegated to footnotes in theories about rules or consequences or the like. But the tradition of Western philosophy is full of answers as to how best to flourish. And some of them don't have resonance for us, but some of them still do. And again, there's a resurgence of popular versions of the wisdom of the Stoics and the wisdom of Aristotle and so on. And presumably they're being sold to people for whom they serve this purpose. They're telling you how to live. The idea is you read this book and you think, well, that, that's helpful. Now, I think at this point it's important to recognize a distinction. You see, philosophers are always making distinctions, but they're, they're useful. Now, this can be put in more than one way, but the way I'm putting it is this, the distinction between the living of your life and the circumstances of your life. Now, the circumstances of your life are those things in your life where you can do nothing about the fact that they're there. It's not up to you that you are the age you are, or that you were born with the gender or ethnicity that you were born with. It's not up to you that you have the genetic inheritance that you have, or that you were brought up the way you have been brought up. Now, it's tempting when thinking of the living and circumstances distinction to think of it in terms of things in your life you can do something about and things that you can't do something about. But that doesn't get it quite right. Some things in my life I can't do anything about. The behavior of many people, for example. <coughs> but the distinction is a bit more nuanced than that. You might say, well, I can't do anything about the way I look. Well, I could if I had plastic, extensive plastic surgery. I can't do anything about the language I speak. Well, I could if I made big efforts and learned another language and moved to another culture. And for many things. Um, many aspects of our life that don't seem to be up to us, our looks and things like that, we can do something about, often at great effort and expense. So that's why I've called the circumstances the aspects of my life where I can do nothing about the fact they're there. I can try to look younger and falsify my experience, but I can't do anything about the fact that I was born in the year that I was born. I can live healthily and take exercise or not, but I can't do anything about having the actual genetic heritage that I have. And so many aspects of the circumstances of my life turn out to be historical in nature. They refer to my past and to the present effects of my past. And I think this just reflects the fairly mundane point that by the time I start thinking about how to flourish, I already have a life. And the life I have is the present result of a past. So this is, as it were, a stunningly obvious point about flourishing. But it's very important, I think, for clear thinking about it. By the time you get to thinking about it, you are already on the way. You already have a life. There's already a lot of stuff about you that's true of you in virtue of your past and you can do nothing about the fact that it's in your past. You can do something about it now, but you can't rewrite history. You can't go back in time and rewrite your history. So that's just because we don't start thinking about how to live our lives until we're adults, or nearly so. We don't start thinking about flourishing in a vacuum. And some philosophical um, thinking about flourishing tends to ignore this point, as though you could start from scratch thinking about flourishing and then decide to live in the best way. Well, no, you, you already come with a life. You've already come with a, with a power, a unique past. We can do a lot about many of the circumstances of our lives. Many people spend a huge amount of time and energy making ourselves thinner, healthier, generally fighting back the effects of age and genetic heritage. But we can't do anything about the fact of age, gender, and ethnicity that we were born with. So that's the circumstances. What's the living of my life? It's the way I deal with the circumstances of my life. I can't do anything about having the genetic heritage for health I have, but something's up to me, namely how I deal with it. I can be proactive about it. I can go out and find if I have um, a heritage for breast cancer and do something about it, or I can just forget about it, but prefer not to know, stick my head in the sand. And which of the two I do makes a big difference to the way I live my life and to the amount of control I have over aspects of my life. And I can't do anything about having the parents I have, but something's up to me, namely the way I deal with my relationship with them. And the same with children. I can't change the way my children are, but I do have control over how I relate to them. 
what my relationship them, with them will be. Now, in ancient ethical thinking, this is put in terms of a metaphor, which I think is very useful. It's put in terms of the skill of living exercised on the materials of living. The person who lives her life well and flourishes is compared to a craftsperson exercising her skill on her materials to produce a work of skill, sometimes a work of art. So living your life unskillfully, making a mess of your life, is compared to being a bad craftsperson who botches the job. Now, the skill metaphor is useful in various ways. I'll bring some of them out. But not least, it impresses on us the fact that the craftsperson's skill is a different kind of thing from the materials on which it's exercised. They're not more or less of the same kind of thing. And the metaphor can be applied in various ways. Of course, like any metaphor, it has its limits, but I think it has a lot of useful applications too. The quality of the materials generally has much to do with the quality of the results. Good clay produces a good pot, good material produces a good dress, and so on. But it doesn't determine what the craftsperson does with them. A bad craftsperson can produce a mess out of good clay or good cloth. Now, I'll note here, and I'll mention it again briefly at the end, in my use of this metaphor, I'm employing it more widely than the ancients did. That for them, uh, ancient ethics, it's always the case that virtue is the skill of living. For them, it's the virtuous life that's the flourishing life. And I'm not here making that case. The case for virtue being the necessary for flourishing and virtue being the skill of exercised on the materials of life. That would need a whole other argument, um, and much longer one, which I'm not going to, I can't produce today. I'm simply pointing out to the, pointing to the more general um, difference between the way you live your life and the materials of your life, which can be regarded as what you're exercising skill or expertise on. So I think the distinction makes it a bit clearer what we're asking when we ask how to flourish. We're asking for advice about how <coughs> to live. And this means advice as to the living of our lives. And it's advice how to live our lives, how to deal with the circumstances of our lives, not advice as to which circumstances to have. And I think that in turns for two reasons. Firstly, for some circumstances, it makes no sense. You can't ask for advice on how old to be because it's not up to you how old you are. You can't ask for advice which parents to have, which language and culture to have been brought up in. But of course, um, there are some aspects where it does make sense. Before having children, it certainly makes sense to ask whether to have them, and similarly with getting married, seeking success in a competitive field, and so on. Once these things are in our lives, we can't wish them away, and so it's very important to um, seek advice, get the best way uh, as to the best sort of deliberation as to how to make them parts of our lives. And so this leads to another point. As you get older, more of the, the circumstances of your life will have been brought there by the living of your life. Once you're married, you can't bring it about that you're not married, but that's been brought about by your deciding to get married and so on. This is one way in which the unspecificity of your goals gets more specific as you age and have more experience. More of the circumstances of your life have been built into your life by you and not just by your parents, the way you've been brought up and so on. Now, the fact that these things like getting married and so on have value for us as circumstances of our lives that we bring about can lead to the idea that these things have value for flourishing just in themselves, without reference to the way you relate to them and the way you deal with them in your life. And I think this can lead to trouble. But this idea that, that things like marriage and money and a career have value in themselves for your flourishing, without any reference to the role you give them in your life, has had some appeal, both to philosophers and to psychologists. Some philosophers have thought flourishing consists in having what is labelled an objective list of things. There are things that have value, there's an objective list, you flourish if you go out and get a reasonable number of them. And psychologists sometimes too. Um, David Meyer's book, The Pursuit of Happiness, at the end of it offers a list of things which he says enable happiness. And he lists things like having fit bodies, uh, positive self-esteem, supportive friendships, challenging work, active leisure, acceptance, outward focus, hope, and so on. And he says, well, you don't have to go for all of these things. It depends on you, to some extent, which of things 
things matter for your flourishing. So he says, he's not telling us to go for these things directly. The book, he says, is like Consumer Reports. Consumer Reports doesn't tell us what to buy, because that has to depend on our personal needs. But we'd be foolish to ignore its information when we're making choices. So it's useful to know that, in general, people are happier who are married and have a religion, um, but that might not suit you. But I think there's a, a deeper problem here than the tailoring to circumstances point. And again, we can see it if we think of the skill metaphor again. Better materials don't make you better at dealing with them. A good result is produced by the application of expertise, not by the good materials in themselves. So money in itself doesn't make your life a flourishing one. Some people will live a flourishing life in a way that's furthered by having money and security. Others will be led by having money and security to mess up their lives. A big house, several cars, all the latest electronics from Hamakish Lemma don't have the power in themselves to get you to put them to good use in your life. You might waste them or put them to positively destructive use. So that's true of stuff generally. I saw a great flyer once from a department store. Money doesn't make you happy, shopping does. <laughs> And he said, well, it's on the right lines, you know, <coughs> money in itself doesn't make you happy. You've got to do something with it before it makes any contribution. But I think this is obviously true of stuff, right? Money doesn't make you happy, shopping does. But it's also true of relationships. Relationships, even if with your parents or your partner or children, siblings, they don't themselves have the power to make your life flourishing or not. You're not made happy just by having siblings or children. Whether they further a flourishing life depends on you and the role you give to these relationships in your life. So marriage is, although it's not stuff like a new car, it's like it in that neither is the right kind of thing to make your life a flourishing one. If your view of your own life is confused or if you're on a self-destructive course, then either getting a new car or getting married is like trying to become a better carpenter by buying better wood. The carpenter needs the expertise, and you need to think more about your life and the way it's going and the way your goals are integrated or not um, before you, that's what you need to work on before you take on commitments and liabilities, never mind buying stuff. That's why the idea of retail therapy is such a, a weird one, you know, as though sort of buying stuff is in itself good for you. Um, so, as we live our lives, we increasingly fill in and make determinate the unspecific outlines of the idea of a flourishing and well-lived life. And we always make our choices against the background of and among the circumstances of our lives, the unchosen aspects of our lives. And as we live longer and have more experiences, the unchosen, the, the aspects that are now unchosen, come to be more and more the result of the choices we've made. I mean, just to take a very mundane example, once you get married and have children, this obviously constrains the further choices you can make that affect the way your life will go. We all know that, but its relevance for the idea of flourishing isn't often put in proper context. As we change our options, we change the way our lives are organized. Mistakes are made. Careers are abandoned. Our priorities and values are made more determinate by making mistakes as well as by making successes. So we go from having this very general, vague idea of flourishing to a more determinate one by making it determinate by what we do by the major choices we make as to how to live. Now, many um, philosophers, at any rate, who discuss this idea about our final end, um, think if we have a final end, then it's got to be fairly determinate. Our task is working out the means to, to do it. But that's to treat us all as though we were like some people who do start with determinate ends. I mean, musical prodigies or athletic prodigies, they probably do, from fairly early on, have a very determinate end. <coughs> win the Olympics, play at Carnegie Hall. Of course, then once you've done that, you then have to start again thinking about your life as a whole. But for them, some part of their life may be a way of means to reaching this very determinate overall life goal. But for most of us, it's not like that. It's not filling in a dotted outline or checking off a list of good things like money, status, marriage and so on, but learning through trial and error how to make a good job of the materials life offers us. And obviously, getting it right is cumulative and getting it wrong is cumulative too. So I hope 
this is giving you some sense of the importance of thinking in terms of flourishing when we think in terms of whole lives, and especially when we think of the project of improving lives. So it's a matter of thinking of our lives in the structured way as well as the linear way, of thinking in terms of our goals and eventually of the way our goals are organised by way of integration in and negotiation in terms of the how we progressively fill in and make more determinate the vague idea of living a flourishing life. So, so far we've got a result which is not uncommon in philosophy, may, not, may be disappointing to psychologists. Philosophers often show, I think, the way not to go about thinking of flourishing and point it to the place and role of what the right way is, namely developing the skill of living as you develop the carpenter's expertise or the expertise of being a quarterback or something like that. But I haven't said anything you can go out and do now. I haven't said in specific terms what the skill of living consists in. How do we learn to live well? Well, again, what it isn't. Philosophers are always much better at saying what something isn't than what something is. Um, this is not a call for a single way of life that everyone should live who hopes to live well. Sometimes people raise this objection, they say. Look, if there's a sensible question, how can I flourish? and there's a sensible answer to it, it's going to say something specific about how to flourish. But that's not going to suit everybody. It's only going to suit people with a certain talent or people in one culture or something like that. And so it's going to turn out to be elitist. Sometimes people think Aristotle said this, that he said there's only one flourishing life, the life of philosophical contemplation. If he did, this would be a dreadful example of high-minded but unrealistic philosophers setting too high a standard. But it should be obvious from what I've said that this is wrong. There are many ways of living a good life and flourishing, obviously. But this is already accounted for in the fact that different people have different circumstances of life. We don't have to account for it all over again in the living of the life. Different ways of life in different cultures can be lived well or badly. Philosophers, caregivers, engineers, can all flourish and all make a mess of their lives. So in one way, flourishing is the same for everyone, but in one way it's different for every individual because flourishing is always done in the circumstances of your life and those are different for everybody. So we need to be told how to live well in a way that will hold over a wide variety of ways of life. The skill of living is not limited to a single area but can be applied across a range of different circumstances and ways of life. People live their lives well, whether they're a president or a worker, rich or poor, and, and so on. Well, where can we get knowledge of such a skill? I think in the past, people often turned to religion. But I think, again, I would, wouldn't I? The oldest answer is the best, that the answer comes from philosophy. And this may think strange to you if you think philosophy is just what goes on in the philosophy department, and perhaps you know people who do philosophy of physics or something like that. And that has little to do with living your life well. And even some philosophers who do ethics think that working on ethics has little to do with illuminating the good life for non-philosophers. But some contemporary philosophers do think we should at least try rejoining the long-standing tradition that philosophy does make an important contribution to the aim we have of living our lives well and flourishing. And as often, we find the clearest example of this in the ancient world. Philosophers assumed to flourish, you need to lose some philosophy. People who didn't go to the philosophical schools didn't think that, of course. They thought you should go to your grandfather and ask for advice or something like that. But philosophy, at least, offers you some clarity about the alternatives. And once you focus in enough to see, flourishing is not a matter of acquiring a to-do list of stuff to get and relationships to, have, to form. It's guidance as to how to live your life by acquiring and applying understanding of how to deal with stuff, things, and relationships in your life. And this is what the ancients call practical wisdom. To acquire practical wisdom, you need to study life, and you also need to study theory. Most of the ancient philosophers thought you need to study all of philosophy. Aristotle doesn't. He thinks some people have practical wisdom without studying philosophy. So there's a range of views there. But to flourish, you need to acquire practical wisdom. 
And it plays, practical wisdom plays the role of skill in a skill analogy. It's what you need in order to make a good job of the materials of your life. Now again, um, this is the end of the lecture, not the beginning of another. There's another whole study of what practical wisdom is. This is actually um, a case where philosophers and psychologists are already, to some extent, doing the same thing. The philosopher Val Valerie Tiberius has written a lot on um, wisdom and the reflective living of a life, and she's uh, read a lot of uh, psychological studies on wisdom. There's quite a lot out there in the literature, so there's quite a lot of work being done there already. Uh, so if you want to know what practical wisdom is, there is already quite a lot of things, uh, quite a lot of things you could read to help you with that. And if you doubt that it exists, I think just look around and think about friends you know, people who make a mess of their lives, people who don't make a mess of their lives, people who live their lives intelligently. Not necessarily the people who are rich or successful or who win all the prizes or who have the outward signs of having a lot of stuff, but the people who um, know how to live their lives well. That, as I say, as so stated, that's a very general idea, but it's not one on which we have no empirical purchase. Um, you could start looking at the empirical literature on the subject. But I think one conclusion that it seems reasonable to draw is that when we investigate flourishing, either philosophically or by way of the empirical social sciences, it's really <coughs> crucial to bear in mind this difference between the materials of a life and the living of a life. We don't know whether someone's flourishing just because she's beautiful, rich and famous and is all over People magazine. We're all familiar with people who have all these things and who have very unenviable lives. And the more beautiful, rich and famous they are, the worse mess of their lives they often make. The material goods and relationships in your life make a difference to the way you live, but on their own, they do nothing for you. You have to live your life. You give these things significance in your life by the way you deal with them. So we can't usefully study the role that things like money play in someone's life independently of the role she gives money in her life. For one person, owning a house may be a source of pride and warm feelings. For another, it's just an investment. So it's not that having a house is a good thing for everybody, whatever use you want to make of it. It depends what use you want to make of it. And so before we assess the materials of a life, in ascertaining whether it's a flourishing life or not. We need to know what kind of end product they make up. What's the product life? What has the person done to them? What do they intend to do with them? And I said, of course, taking this point seriously makes empirical investigation into flourishing more complicated. But I think in the end, we're more likely to have focused on the right thing. Thank you. <laughs> oh, um, it, OK. Um, I, I want to ask a bit about the separation between uh, the flourishing and the material mm -hmm. uh, parts of your life. And it seems that what you're saying is that um, the, the, the material conditions aren't sufficient for flourishing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, it seems to me that certain uh, conditions, uh, circumstances, are necessary for flourishing. For instance, you can't have a slave who flourishes. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you would touch on that. Well, I agree. You could say there's a... Oh, yes. Um, the difference between flourishing and the material conditions are some material conditions not necessary for flourishing. For example, a slave can't flourish. Um, well, I'd be... Um, there are two ways of thinking about flourishing. One is to say you can flourish in any circumstances. So there's a way of flourishing even if you're poor or a slave or something like that. That's the very egalitarian way of thinking of flourishing. There is a difference between <coughs> living a life well and not living a life well, even in very bad circumstances. That's very roughly the stoic way to go. Or you could say, yes, there are some material circumstances that give you a flaw, and beneath that, people can't flourish. Um, and if you think that, then you have to think that millions and millions of people in the world today have no hope of flourishing because they don't have any access to, say, clean water, they're not likely to live beyond 22, um, that sort of thing. Uh, now, I think intuitively, our intuitions cut both ways on that. I mean, what you said is intuitive, but I think it's also intuitive to say there are people living in horrible conditions who are still doing as good a job as they could do in those conditions. Um, 
So I, I th right, there are these two ways. Um, that, that difference runs through a lot of ancient debates about flourishing. Uh, near the end, you mentioned that um, you know, we can have money or, or many objects. Yeah. And that only, part of the reason that makes us happy is because you know, we put value on those things. Yeah. Um, but I, I, if you mentioned this earlier in the talk, I um, apologize, but the, pro the, the problem ahead of that was it seems as though you were assuming that we have full control or what we put value on. Sure, you know, we, we grow up from childhood and we, are, we see the world around us and that's how we, you know, obtain our values and obtain yeah. in our inclinations. And we, we think, okay, everybody's chasing money, you're chasing objects, so and we adopt that and we don't even realize it. So by the time you're 20 or 30 or 40, these values have become so inter internalized and from you know, neuro neuro a neurological perspective, we're literally hardwired that way. So how can, how can you just, you know, in the snap of a finger say, I'm not gonna value money anymore and I'm not gonna let that, I'm not gonna let that make me happy because no matter how much you try, you will still think money would bring you happiness. Money, I mean anything. Yeah. Um, yes, can we ever change from valuing some material good like money when we're brought up and this produces neurological changes? Well, does it mean that we can't change? Because people do. I mean, you know, um, teaching philosophy classes, um, people will often say things like that, you know, that um, our values, you know, our values just given to us by our upbringing and so on. And sometimes you say, so you think everything your parents think? And they say, oh, God, no. I mean, <laughs> it's the last thing I think. So <laughs> people do change. I mean, it's very standard for people in their teens to think, you know, everything my parents think is, is wrong. Um, and also, even in later life, people often do have, I mean, that's what the midlife crisis is, is all about. And again, philosophers perhaps see more of this than other people. Um, we see people coming in as mature students who've spent their life making money and then decided this wasn't a valuable goal and they want to do something else. And they often turn to philosophy first as, as a way of finding out the things that matter. They don't always intend to and end up in philosophy. So a lot of people change. And um, you could also say, although this is a bit harder to, to show, that a lot of people who don't change suffer for it. You know, they <laughs> a lot of people feel trapped in, in lives because they haven't changed. And that's not to say at any moment you can remake your life. I mean, people have liabilities and commitments, but you can, there are some things you can change. Yeah. So, I'm not so I'm not convinced that we change neurologically in such a way that we can't reflect on our lives and values. I mean, some things change in the brain, right? But um, I'm just going round the room. I think. Okay. Yeah, well, first of all, um, well, th the distinction I draw is orthogonal to, oh yeah, the question, well, the three, um, there are robust empirical findings about free will and having less free will than we think. Well, whether those are right or not, the distinction I'm making is orthogonal to that. I mean, the distinction is, you cannot do anything about being the age you are, but you can do something about the attitude you have to it. Um, so, that's not a question of, of, you know, free will, it doesn't bring free will into it. There are things in our lives that we can um, do something about and things that we can't. And that's quite orthogonal to the free will issue, I think. Um, secondly, what about traumatic um, events? Well, yes, traumatic events can make an impact on people that it's difficult or sometimes impossible for them to overcome. But I don't think that's an objection to what I've been saying about flourishing particularly. I mean, that is a problem for any ethical account. Um, that's just a fact that any theory has to take into account. Um, and also, um, a theory of ethics, I think, probably shouldn't focus on 
um, outlying cases in order to draw, to draw conclusions about the central cases. So. And thirdly, um, mental problems can be part of one's character, so uh, the... Uh, Well, th yeah, th well, there's two points, really. One is, theory is that your personality is largely determined. Um, well, I'm not a psychologist, so I shouldn't hold forth. But I do on, on that. However, I'll hold forth for a tiny bit. Um, it does depend what you mean by personality, and it's not always clear that psychologists are talking about exactly the same thing that either ordinary people or philosophers are talking about. Um, but secondly, right, as the circumstances in that sense are not external. So um, they're, if you like, they're external to the self they're external to what you can do something about. So um, people who are depressed can take antidepressants. That's, all, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. Now, that, of course, involves recognizing that you're depressed. And I, I realize that there's a big problem in people recognizing that they're depressed. But it's not as though you can now do nothing about aspects of your personality. There are many things you can do about aspects of your personality. And people are encouraged to do them all the time. I mean, there's a whole industry uh, uh, about that. So again, I don't think it produces a problem for the account I'm giving. You don't look happy with those answers, though. No. <laughs> hey. When we talk about flourishing, personal flourishing, do we have a responsibility to ensure that that flourishing doesn't come at the expense of somebody else's? So in other words, you know, if my personal flourishing is increasing at the expense of somebody else's, which is decreasing, mm -hmm. does that therein detract from my definition of my flourishing, that I'm flourishing less because somebody else is yeah. being sacrificed? Yeah, should we ensure that our, my flourishing doesn't come at the expense of other people's? Well, I think yes, but I haven't said anything in this talk that would justify that. Um, that you would have to fill in an account of practical wisdom according to which you have to live in a and uh, a virtuous ethical way in order to flourish. And um, that's not as um, strange as it often sounds at first, but I haven't said anything to justify that. Um, as far as I, what I've said, I think all it would support is that when you want other people to flourish, you realize you don't make people flourish just by, so to speak, spreading a lot of goods around. You don't um, make children flourish by giving them a lot of toys. You know? And you don't necessarily help people um, by just giving them stuff. What you help, how you help them is by getting them better able to make use of what they've got. Again, that um, may sound like a bit of folk wisdom, but I think it's actually very deeply true that you cannot, in that sense, make other people, other people flourish. You can only help them to make their own lives flourishing lives. Everybody has to make their own lives flourishing lives. So you can give them the material to do it, but you can't do it for them. Yeah. So what would you say is the necessary condition of flourishing? Because from what I've understood is that there's a lot of circumstances that are not sufficient. Mm -hmm. but is there any basic circumstance that's necessary for flourishing? Well, you have to be um, a person able to, uh, able to reflect about your life. That's, that's all. Somebody who can reflect about the life they've got. Um, in fact, I think everybody does. You know, we, we have this picture from the movies of slackers who sit around and do nothing but watch TV. But even people like that, at some point, think about the kind of lives, lives they're living. That's all you need. You need to be somebody who can reflect about their lives in a way that makes that distinction. What am I doing with the stuff I've got? Um, and that leads you to, you know, it's different for everybody. Maybe I'm neglecting talents or whatever. Yeah. Well, some philosophers' theories have that implication, uh, either explicitly or more politely. <laughs> but no, I mean, you just have to make the distinction between what you can do with your life and the materials of your life. Now, um, once you've made that distinction, people tend to get interested in, in the idea and to look for, you know, answers in religion or, or philosophy. But no, the thought is, on this model, everyone can flourish if they think about their lives and reflect them on in the right kind of way, unless there are some material prerequisites, and you know, that's, n that's not a settled issue. And just one more thing, yeah. sorry, but um, what's the bright line on that then? So what is the bright line that says, like, this person has to reflect this much now to be necessary to contribute to flourishing? Well, again, um, there's no general answer on that. Um, 
because it would depend on, on your circumstances. So educated people need less to, um, to trigger them to reflection than um, people who aren't educated, um, unless they live in a tradition that, in, that encourages it. So, um, kind of building on that, would you expect um, sort of young adults who have already developed, like, are, are thinking and are reflecting to some extent more than children, um, but haven't yet developed the skills um, acquired through experience mm -hmm. to then be more likely to um, be um, less happy, less not Sorry. flourishing yet, um, to be something that develops over time, and how would you suggest that? Well, uh, I'm not in a position to suggest helpful things, but I think that's right, that often teenagers ask themselves these questions and they often make horrible mistakes and get depressed and have existential crises because they don't have the experience to deal with the issues well. Um, and they start thinking, you know, everything will be fine if I become a rock star or something like that. And um, there's, of course... People don't want to squash ideals, you don't want to squash dreams, but then there's the experience that teaches you whether you have the talent or not, and so on. And I think, indeed, I think young teenagers, that's one reason why teenagers have, have problems. It's because they reflect about their life and they haven't got enough life lived to give them enough material to um, give them appropriate ways of, of dealing with it. I, I don't know how, that, how one would deal with that. I mean, you can't just give teenagers more experience. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody else has. I, I, I don't know if this has been studied, this aspect. Of, uh, yeah? Isn't there a certain luxury in choice? And in, in that sense of having the luxury of choice, isn't there a sense of elitism attached to that? Well, it depends what line you take about material conditions. Um, everybody has to choose how to live in some way or other even if you don't have much choice about what you do or how much you earn or something like that, you have a choice how to regard your life, whether to um, just give in and live day to day or whether to uh, take a, a more positive attitude to your life. And I think anybody except the very depressed can do that. And in fact, um, people with the most choices over circumstances often make the most mistakes. So, it, you know, People who are rich enough to have several houses and lots of cars and so on often make the most spectacular mistakes <laughs> about how to live well. Um, I mean, it's interesting that nowadays we always focus on the problems that um, poor and disadvantaged people have about living well. But in the ancient tradition, there's, an, an, there's also a concern about the way rich people often live bad lives, that having riches and power often make you live uh, very messy and unsuccessful lives. So uh, I, it's not as it were having a choice over um, how, to, how to live makes you a better candidate. Everyone has an equal chance, unless you think there are some material prerequisites. Yeah, James. I'd like to go back to the first question that was asked. Um, and I, I think this formulation is very helpful in terms of conditions versus skills. Yeah. Um, and it's another way of, of formulating a point that I think is um, very key that conditions are not sufficient for yeah. happiness. Thinking about it the other way around, though, in terms of conditions being potentially necessary for happiness, and you pointed out that there are two different intuitions yeah. along these lines, one roughly the stoic intuition. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could comment about, it seems to me that that may well be an intuition, but it's also a dangerous intuition because it can give um, rise to a kind of um, laissez-faire sort of view, well, you know, I can't help my neighbor because, or I don't need to worry about helping my neighbor because yeah. after all, my neighbor doesn't need uh, a change. And yes. they need, they don't, people on the other side of the world don't need to have water anyway. Yeah. They would be happy without it. So isn't there a, isn't there a, a danger in terms of um, justice? And well, again, I think there's a division. I mean, there is a danger in terms of justice, that if you think, well, people can be happy whatever their conditions. Let's say, well, then, does it really matter that we care about clean water in these places because they can flourish in spite of it? But the opposite sort of intuition is the thought. Um, if you don't think of them as somebody with any kind of control over how they live their life, you're not really respecting them. Um, that you just have to divide your concern for them as human beings who have, a li uh, each of them has a life of their own and uh, to respect their dignity is to realize they do that. 
and separate that from a concern for their material conditions. And there's no reason why you shouldn't respect people as individuals who each lives their own life and also think <laughs> they should have clean water. So I don't think that it's necessarily undermining concern for people. I mean, you could, I'm trying to work my way into saying it gives you a better grounds for it, but I don't think I can do that. Um, it certainly doesn't undermine the thought that you should help people flourish by giving them the conditions of flourishing. That you think, even if you do, and not everybody does, in the stoic way, that even in bad conditions, people can make the most of it and do a better job than, um, than they might have done. I'm struggling with the, the relation between a meaningful and a flourishing life. Yeah. And I'm thinking of a sort of an inverse Susan story of, say, a scientist who accomplishes a great deal of curing diseases is always dissatisfied, mm -hmm. always feeling that you know, he hasn't done it quickly or well enough, mm -hmm. so that he's made a big positive impact that we call it a meaningful life. Thing. Mm -hmm. And yet, I'm not sure I would want to call that a flourishing life. But this is in a way the opposite of Susan, except it's not a rediscovery. Yes, that's right. Well, I think that would be right. I mean, if somebody makes a lot of discoveries, but is persistently depressed and unhappy about them, doesn't enjoy working, doesn't take any pleasure in what he's achieved, there seems to be something missing. I say, what's missing? Well, it's not the achievements, they're all there. It's the person's attitude to their achievements. So does, that the does a flourishing life have to be meaningful even though a meaningful life need not be flourishing? Well, um, every life doesn't have to have lots of accomplishments. I mean, because I don't want to have the elitist thought that, you know, uh, actors and athletes have, uh, have accomplishments, but people have to work all the time for a living and have no leisure don't to come. So you don't have to have accomplishments. People can live meaningful lives with very little by way of material goods. I mean, we think of people in the um, other parts of the world, but then, you know, think of your own ancestors several generations back. With our <laughs> people often had very little in their lives and, and yet lived meaningful lives. But yes, a life could be meaningful, but it could be lacking in that respect, that you just don't get anything out of it. And some people do. Oh, I don't know. I, I'm not keeping chronology here. I'm sorry. Okay. You opened up your conversation with a discussion about policy. Yeah. I was wondering if this uh, concept of factual wisdom could be uh, translated mm. into the policymaking process to produce flourishing societies. Mm. Um, and has it been done? Has a uh, particular government body or policy uh, body done incorporated practical wisdom into the policymaking mm. process to create flourishing Yes, I'm, I'm, I keep forgetting to repeat the question. Um, could the concept of practical wisdom be built into government policy? Well, I think um, if something like the recognition of the distinction between how people live their lives and the material conditions for them to live their lives happily were built into government policy, uh, it would be more effective. Um, because merely finding out how people feel about their lives is not going to tell you, is not going to give you the right kind of information about how they're living <laughs> in ways that could lead you to improve them, I think. Um, I can see why people go for the happiness studies because they say, well, you know, GNP doesn't work and, you know, just how much, what, what people go for, what, what people spend their money on doesn't tell you enough about their actual wants and needs. But um, how they respond, to how they feel at the time doesn't necessarily show you that they're living their lives well. Um, I don't know how you'd go about operationalizing it, um, about operationalizing it. Um, make them employ philosophy graduates, I suppose, yeah. help with the, uh, the employment situation. <laughs> but, I mean, that's not a wholly stupid idea, I think, because people ha have often not, not thought enough about these policies before deciding they're a good idea. Yeah, Marty. Well, yeah. It's a related question. Yeah. So if you were on David Cameron's <laughs> committee to devise <laughs> the question, yeah. to ask the British <laughs> population, uh, what would you ask? And, uh, and, and right. so live question, actually, that. because the committee's, the future of what's asked is not settled. Yeah. Well, um, the rough idea would be, I would try and ask questions that elicited the difference. You know, how are your material circumstances? That is, you know, are you employed, unemployed? Um, if, has your salary gone up and, and so on? And then questions that would elicit how this has affected what you would take to be 
say, the quality of your life? I mean, has the quality of your life gone down a lot because of um, uh, unemployment or, or something like that? Um, questions about people's goals and plans and how much they've changed. Um, and not just about how much they're earning, but about how their goals and plans are affected by having a baby in the house, that sort of thing. Um, I'm, I just, uh, this is sounding a bit unsophisticated. It would take a lot of thinking to get the right kind of question. Um, but you'd, you'd also have to ask them how they regard their goals in relation to what their goals were five years ago, how they imagine their future goals and how they think their life now is shaping up in terms of their life as a whole. Uh, uh, you'd, of course, you'd need more than just beeping people on an iPhone to do that. You'd, you'd have to get them to answer a lot of, a lot of quite complicated <laughs> questions. Um, I don't know if that sort of survey works. Does it work, asking well, people? I think what they're really after hmm. is to judge public policy by the amount of flourishing mm. that it produces. So yeah. then the question is, what would you ask people to find, okay. on your point of view, to find out if public policy has increased? Well, if I were anywhere near any levers of power, I would find some psychologists to brainstorm with and get the right kind of questions because they know how to, do, to ask these. You know. Philosophers don't ask these questionnaires because we, we, you know, some of the um, X5 people do uh, give people questionnaires, but it's not designed to find out that kind of thing about them. But right, I think there could be a perfectly good questionnaire that would actually be useful. Um, and I, th I think you're right, they want to find out if people are flourishing and improve their lives, but asking them how they're feeling doesn't seem the right way of going about doing it. And I was quite shocked by it. Three out of four questions about how do you feel? Yeah. <coughs> oh. yeah. This last part of this discussion is uh, based on the assumption that government should be in the business of uh, making people mm. flourish. flourish. Yes. Uh, yeah. Do you want to uh, accept that assumption or do you want to uh, distance yourself from that assumption? <laughs> suggest instead, well, perhaps government has something to do with some provision of uh, what might turn out to be some minimal conditions, yeah. uh, either uh, equality of opportunity or some equality of resources, but beyond that, maybe not. Well, no, I think what the government should do would you be to use this information to find out how they can enable people to flourish by exactly those things. Find out how miserable people are made by not having equal opportunities. Find out how, um, uh, you know, how family life needs this, that, and the other, or doesn't. But uh, in the end, you can't get other people to flourish. Everybody, I have, to fl I have to do my flourishing, you have to do yours. So I think they should be aware of that, <laughs> that they're providing conditions for flourishing. They're not actually increasing flourishing itself. Everybody has to do their own flourishing. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, it was the person behind you. Yeah. I, I was thinking that one, one obvious difference between nation ethics and nation discussion about virtue and happiness is, and modern discussions, is that the ancient discussions are much more external. You can say, oh, Maybe the public policy question should be not how do you feel, but is your wife flourishing? <laughs> are your three best friends charging? Are they virtuous? Are they brave? And check out that kind of this. If you ask an individual, are you feeling good? That's going to address the modern sense of happiness, which is focused on freedom. Right. Well, uh, that's why we would need help to get questions that would elicit the first person view that would elicit about flourishing. And I realise I realize we're not used to that. We can tell whether other people are flourishing much better um, than whether we are. Um, you know, is your life going well? And get people to answer that the right way. Not, do you now feel great about your life? About how is your life going? Yeah, I mean, maybe we should get wives to do it for husbands and husbands for wives. I mean, <laughs> that would come more easily. Right? So y you had a, a question there. My uh, statement was that I, I don't think flourishing should be an act of public policy. It should mm -hmm. be much more a personal responsibility that interfaces mm -hmm. and create Well, that, that so is. That, that flourishing but, itself is. Yeah, flourishing itself is. But the public policy, presumably, the, um, the uh, intention they have is to improve the conditions that enable people to flourish. At least I, I hope that's what they're thinking. Yeah. I think there is something uh, which needs tweaking, which is the issue of complexity, mm -hmm. of consequences of action and causation. Yeah. So from that standpoint, 
if you're looking at flourishing, perhaps we need to look at it historically, mm -hmm. that uh, how the individual's life has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, through innovation, through technology, uh, to the rise of mm -hmm. uh, democracy and such things. And we, uh, there are two aspects which uh, economists talk about, which is private good and public good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it was uh, Cromwell who, when it came to property right, said only those who have the property have the right to it. And Locke questioned that and said uh, you know, uh, that uh, uh, property right requires an, an enforcement mechanism. And therefore, Jefferson said the government is the enforcer of, of uh, property right. To that extent, the individual, through democracy, as a form of government where the individual has representation and participation, uh, becomes a participant in, in his own or her own flourishing in the long run through the public policy choices that the individual becomes a uh, participant in. So from that standpoint, the role of government as an enabler, but not as a facilitator, but not as an imposer, uh, does contribute to the notion of flourishing, it seems to me, uh, and the quality of life becomes a very important uh, relationship to the uh, standard of living. Right. Yeah, so I guess that's why it's only recently that governments have even taken it seriously, this idea. Yes, it makes me feel very old. I mean, when I was young, governments would never have even thought of asking this sort of question. You know, <laughs> It was just not on anybody's radar that that's what governments did. Um, and, and the idea that they actually are asking people, they aren't sort of getting a select committee to decide what makes people flourish and then impose that. Yes. yes. A question not relating to governments. Yeah. Um, aside from the matter of personal introspection, like mm -hmm. explanation, what are some reasons for the observation that some people are much more skilled or have more craftsmanship when it comes to managing their lives and flourishing? Certainly, you would look around and you see that some people seem to have it, mm -hmm. and some people live their entire lives and just don't. Yeah. Yes, well, uh, some people seem to have a natural advantage in organizing their lives in a craftsmanlike way. Well, maybe there's an element that corresponds in skill to natural talent. Maybe some people just do have a better ability. Um, if so, then presumably studies would show this up. Um, but I think it has to be like natural talent. I mean, every, something everybody can do, even though some people seem to have an unfair, <laughs> slightly unfair advantage. Uh, and also, I don't know if it is a natural, like a natural talent or not. Um, maybe they've been brought up by disastrous parents and have had to learn how to run their own lives or something like that, or been brought up by parents who ran good lives and, and ran their lives well and, and copied them. Um, I think it's very obscure uh, to what extent some people are better at practical wisdom than others. Um, but I agree, some people certainly seem to be. Yeah. I uh, want to register a problem with the, the term flourishing. Mm -hmm. It comes from flowers. And uh, for a flower, uh, it is preceded by a period of germination mm -hmm. and growth. And it's followed by perhaps a long period of molting. Um, so it's a very temporary thing, or if it's a perennial, uh, flower, a cyclical thing. I wonder if it is realistic. I wonder if a philosopher can make any use of the idea that uh, flourishing might be something cyclic rather than ongoing, long term. Well, civilizations flourish, um, <laughs> so, and they're not cyclical. Um, I take it the notion of flourishing does have the implication that it's to do with your life as a whole and that it. Um, in some species, you don't flourish from the start. There's a period when you have to develop. And as I say, in humans, um, you know, we, when we start thinking about flourishing, we've already got some of the way there. It does sound odd to say children flourish. I mean, maybe children don't flourish. I mean, that's just fa the fact about flourishing. They're learning how to flourish, but they're not flourishing. But, I mean, plants wither and die, but we can flourish a bit longer at the end. So, right, it's... I suppose the metaphor is basically from plants, but I, I, I think we, it has a metaphorical use before we get to human lives. Yeah. Sorry, you, you had a you had a question. Oh, thank you. Um, the 
question of depression in young people yeah. I take very seriously. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, for all kinds of reasons, and I wonder if, um, um, I'm glad that James is in the room, this notion of imparting young people with experience, with mm -hmm. this perspective that might buffer mm -hmm. um, this epidemic of depression that we're seeing in young people, is that the hope of positive humanities? That if we could um, get our young people to pay more attention to, I don't know, Shakespeare or whatever, that that we could somehow impart that experience to them, is that a helpful idea in any way? Well, I'm not an expert, but it certainly seems as though the sort of thing that was indicated is, yeah, um, teenagers often get what you might call a premature maturity. That is, they're encouraged to dress like adults and act like adults before they have the experience to do so. And, I mean, anyone could predict that's going to create some kind of problem. Um, what the answer is, I don't know. It's difficult to compete with popular culture, which is what makes them prematurely mature. Um, and so looking to the humanities for some sort of theme or, or, or um, crystallized perspective, does that make sense to you? Well, yes, it, it does. I mean, again, I, I don't know how I'd go about doing it, but what do you think? Then? Well, just, you know, the humanities, um, I think, is one way in which we try to get experience before we have the actual experience. So yeah. we learn, you know, by reading stories of other people's experience, and we try to profit from it. So we don't have time to make all the mistakes in the world that have ever been made, so we try to um, learn and, and, and grow in that way. So I think that's one way, of, at least, in which the humanities um, get the... the um, the, the, the goal, the idea is to try to um, have the experience. Before and the that. question we map students I'm left with is, okay, let's apply that idea and see if it actually works. Right. Well, I mean, I think if it didn't work, then uh, a lot of us in the room who are uh, <laughs> uh, educators in mm. liberal arts and humanities yes. and so forth would be uh, selling a false bill of goods. But I don't know that this has been, you know, I don't know that this has been um, tested in an empirical way. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an important um, consideration, but at least that's the, that's the whole. Back. I think we have time for one more question. Um, well, can I have two? Two, two hands. Questions. Okay. Right. Um, in going back to the question of um, what makes people flourish and what is flourishing, how do you distinguish, and whether government should help people flourish, how do you distinguish between people who are flourishing and people who are flourishing? Because you said you think it's not just Well, I think I've been talking about individual flourishing, the sort of thing that for which you would take a first-person view. Um, I mean, I, everything I've said really depends upon our uh, being able to take this first-person view on our own lives. Um, but of course, if governments are in the business of e enabling people to flourish, some of the goods they would produce would be public goods. So um, clean water helps everybody flourish. Uh, you know, a good education system helps everybody flourish. You don't need your own private education system. Everybody doesn't need that. So, but the, the flourishing itself is something that I think is properly understood from this first personal point of view. Yeah. In defense of the, the term flourishing, though I'm not an expert, it seems to me it's very apt to compare it to a flower. Because we go through, as humans, through growth, great periods where we're, uh, we're germinating our ideas. We're thinking about our future. We're making decisions. We're preparing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have a sudden bloom that may last a month, that may last six years, that may last change your whole life. So I don't think that it's inappropriate to choose that word and apply it to this idea that we as humans are always in a constant state of exploration or search or change or mm -hmm. anything like that. Okay, fine. Thank you. Extra question, okay. Final, final, final. Um, I, I know that you've been to it many times in, in your talk, but is it a greater s scheme is just to persevere towards your own approach? Therefore, if you were to kind of piecemeal observe elements that you believe to be the ideal flourish or success, it would not apply as much as your own constructed or crafted like you, your personal yeah. abilities aside from other projected attributes of people's success. Well, I, I guess that's right. I mean, when people are young, they have a hero and then they have another hero or they have a passion for this and a passion for that. But that doesn't help you to flourish until 
it doesn't help you to flourish unless uh, until you integrate that concern in your own life which will involve figuring out how good you are at it what the prospects are that sort of thing right so it's as it were the, the you don't make that part of a flourishing life until you have somehow brought it together with all the other th concerns you have in a way that makes sense um, not in a way that's hideously destructive or something like that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. <laughs>